Okay, my friends, we are back here with a new project. This is a Trollson all freezer, 30 inch. It's a it's a UR30 LT, 115 volts R12 system. And we just got this in, and we, it's a little history behind it because some other company put a compressor in here, and also some leak sealer and uh, damaged the, the whole system. And we came in here and uh, determined that it's probably because they used the leak sealer, probably um, there's a restriction in the capillary tube. And according to Trollson, the heat exchanger is no longer available. So what we're gonna do here is we're going to drop the evaporator, take it apart and, and check the cap tube coming in. We're going to take the top off, expose the compressor, and here's your, this looks like your heater loop. These lines go down to the heater loop. And um, so we'll take it apart and, and see what we can find out. The, the complaint right now is that it runs it just doesn't pull down below 16 degrees. So we think it's a restriction. So, okay, if you want to follow along, just uh, stay in touch. Uh, I'll get back to you as soon as we uh, make some progress. Okay, took the cover off the top and the back. And it's pretty messy in here. It's pretty... Uh, Pretty dirty for one thing. We're gonna to have to take it outside and and wash it down. Look, the compressor is not bolted down. Whoever put that compressor in there, um, I don't know what to say about that. It's just a really sloppy work. You got uh, the condenser is three eighths tubing reduced down to five sixteenths and then quarter inch into the dryer there's some oil over here here's your cap tube and your heat exchanger and like i said before the heat exchanger is um, not available anymore so we could make a heat exchanger well one of the things we could do before we change that is we can disconnect uh, the cap tube here and also in the evaporator and, and blow it out and see if it's clogged in any way and if it is then we'll We'll have to manufacture a new one. Uh, we'll just get the right size cap tube and work our way in there. So uh, that's that's the that's where we're going to start. We're going to start first of all by cleaning this thing up, and um, we'll go from there. Okay, let's uh, start cleaning this Trollson. I already started cleaning it. I know wonder why Trollson never put a drain in the bottom of their pieces of equipment because there's no way to get that water out. Anyway, we'll figure that out. In the meantime, I've cleaned the drawers. I may have to I may have to uh, use a steam cleaner on this. Real problem is up here. I need a taller ladder. All right, now. This should be better.
Okay, so I've taken the cover off the compressor. I'm going to check for continuity between the windings and see if they're grounded because this thing blew a fuse. And if it's not that, then I have to look someplace else. So, let's see if we can put this somewhere where you can see it. Common. Not getting any reading there. Ground. So I don't think it's the compressor. Got continuity between the start and the run, the start and the common, the run and the common. So let's try. Let's try putting the relay back on and seeing if it blows the fuse again. Make sure that this is dry. It's got a little moisture on there. Let me blow this off. Okay, so here's what I did. It's now running. Compressor's running. I'm, I'm going to hook up my gauges, but I think what happened was yesterday I plugged this uh, unit into a wall socket that has a CFI, a GFI, and uh, I think that's broke the link because there were other things plugged in there. So I think maybe it's just drawing too much power. And but right now it's running, uh, and we're going to check uh, the pressures and see what we got here. I mean, the whole thing's been cleaned. As you can see, it's a lot cleaner than when it was, and I cannot stand working on dirty machines. Okay, we got a little over 100 there. Not so bad. Make sure these are closed. Now this is a Tecumseh compressor. It's an AE4440Y. And I believe this thing is in a vacuum. Um, there's no gas in it. A little, very little. I have to close this service port before I can open up that line. So I don't think there's a... There should be a Schrader valve in there. Oh yeah, okay. Okay. So we've got just about 20 inches in a vacuum, 110, 15 PSI on the high side. I'm going to assume that there's a leak here. Now, let me see if I can hear. Yeah, it's frosting up. It's starting to work. Oops. It's starting to work. Okay, so now I'm thinking, okay, maybe we have a Freon leak. So let me uh, get set up for that and uh, continue. Okay, so I'm going to start off with this sniffer. See if we can find any leaks. And if we have to, we can use the ultrasound to pinpoint it. Anything there? We might have to nit pressurize it with nitrogen. I think that's going to be what we're going to have to do because right now we have looks like all 65 to 70 pounds. 
back pressure on the low side, same on the high side. So it's balanced out. That would indicate that the, the metering device, the cap tube, is clear. Um, so I don't like the way this filter looks in here. It's, I'm going to try to clean that up. But before I do that, uh, we're going to fill it up with nitrogen and build up the pressure to at least 150, 200 pounds and see if we can find anything that way. I'm not picking anything up. But I'm looking at this joint right here and it does not look secure to me. It looks a little sloppy because you got this thick 3 8 line coming into this quarter inch line. It would have been better to use a reducer. Or you could even step down the 3 8 to 5 16 to quarter, that would look a lot better. Yeah. Not getting anything there. Let me just check the inside. Nothing. Nothing. Well, where does that leave us? Back to the sniffer. And then we could pressurize it some more. And check with soap bubbles. I mean, there's many methods to, to find a leak. These are the most common. But the more simpler way is soap bubbles. And you use your eyes and you look for residue of oil. That's usually when it leaks, it leaks out oil. Let's try one more time here. Nope, not happy. You got plenty of pressure in there too. Of course, if I drain all the nitrogen out and recharge it with 134A, I could run it and then the high side will be uh, with, the, with the high side pressure higher, it might be easier to find the leak. Because if it's a high side leak, it's going to be hard to find when the machine's off. All right, so let's close off the nitrogen tank in our valves. And go back to the drawing board. Okay, so I recovered the Freon. And now I'm going to pull a, a vacuum. And see if it can hold a vacuum. Just want to confirm that it has the leak before I start taking everything apart. Because what I see from, from what I want to do here is replace this uh, line right here. And put something a little neater in here. Maybe I'll get a, a, a larger a larger dryer. 
and then uh, also inside I want to clean that up a little bit and maybe we'll figure out if we really need this or if there's another way so and also inside we got um, we got this joint right here I might want to get a reducer a couple of reducers to reduce it down so that's not all bunched up like that but basically it's um, the compressor is running I and mean, that's good news so we'll bolt the compressor down hopefully find out where this is leaking from uh, by the way this is not a low pressure control this is a thermostat and here is the feeler bulb for the thermostat which comes down and goes down the back and comes in this is a feeler bulb it's connected to the evaporator so there's no there's no um, low pressure control in here okay so that's it for now and uh, we'll uh, continue on okay so we're down to about 29 inches which is pretty good for um, this system this pump but we're not really concerned so much about drying out the system as we are concerned about finding out if it can hold a vacuum but because if it can't hold a vacuum it means it's leaking out somewhere and we need to find a leak but other than that it's um, it's not as bad as I thought okay okay so this um, unit's been sitting now for an hour and it's come out of a vacuum it was coming up slowly and slowly it took about an hour for it to for it to balance out so we know we have a leak we have to find it I will find it but before I do that I'm going to dress this up a little bit and put I, I have a feeling it's leaking from this um, cap tube here because I saw a little re oil residue on here when I first got this unit in and then we were picking up traces over here so by eliminating this um, these joints here and putting one joint uh, that might help and then we can look for leaks again okay we'll be back okay here's a progress report uh, we cut this piece of tubing out in this dryer you can see I cut it right there uh, because we're going from three-eighths down to quarter inch and I think it should be stepped down properly and make it look a little neater and it, this looks just too sloppy for my taste so and here's the other end here um, anyway I have a new dryer I stepped this down this is five sixteenths tubing to quarter inch and I put a little tip on this dryer we have we can put the uh, the capillary tube through there okay so I have this other 3 8 tubing which goes on here like so I have to clean that joint out before I solder it but this is going to go like this just like in there and then we can run our cap tube in there and it means it's a little neater than what it was and it's a little I mean I just didn't like the way that looked and uh, we have to move this compressor over and put some bolts in there I just don't like the way that looks either so and probably eliminate this we don't really need this because we since we don't have a low pressure control we can just put our gauge on here and back seat this to close off the to close off the valve all right so uh, I'll get back to you let me get this hooked up okay so now this is a little neater you got that old welt soldered in there and um, I'm a little I'm better um, I like the way it came out it's a lot it's a lot neater than what it was before now I pressurized the sealed system with compressed air I know you're not supposed to do that because compressed air has moisture in it but I'm going to pull a vacuum on it anyway and uh, but we got about a hundred pounds on the high side and this is about 85 on the low side and we're just going to let that sit because yesterday when we checked it out it leaked out within an hour so we knew we had a leak so we're going to check it 
And while we're checking that and waiting for that, uh, I have another problem here. I have another problem here with this cover for the evaporator. Uh, the nipple, you can see the nipple is broken off. It goes in like that. So we are going to attempt to solder this back on since this is all aluminum and I recently picked up this new this map gas torch turbo torch and it works pretty good actually I was um, brazing with it it gets really hot so it saves me a trip uh, it saves on acetylene and uh, it makes it makes the job a lot cheaper the only problem I shouldn't say problem, but the difference is the flame is really big. So when you're working inside a refrigerator and it's a tight spot, you might need to, to use your uh, turbo tip torch with maybe a number three or five tip. Uh, but anyway, we just tested this piece of aluminum and soldered using this uh, solder which is, uh, hold on, it's over here somewhere. Um, I have some here from Muggy Weld and there was some other solder that I was using. I don't know where I put it. Oh, here it is. This is AL822 from Lucas Millhopped. This is um, aluminum solder, it's uh, flux core, and I tested on this aluminum, and it worked out well, and it puddled really nice, got a little puddle there, so I'm going to clean that cover up as best I can, and attempt to solder that nipple back in while we're waiting to see if this pressure is going to hold up. And if the pressure does hold up, then we'll pull a vacuum on the system. And we'll um, charge it up. Only other problem is this shroud is kind of warped. It's probably got warped from the heat. I'm going to have to fix that. Maybe I'll, I could either trim the little piece off of here uh, or I could maybe um, force this up some way, maybe by using a piece of uh, aluminum underneath there to keep that up like that so it doesn't hit. Other than that, uh, another thing is uh, I noticed that this compressor, I don't know if you can see that in there, there is a bolt holding this compressor down. The bolt holes for the old compressor are much larger. You can, if you can see the, the, the blind nuts in here. Uh, that's, so this compressor it has a different footing. And I'm sure there's a kit to adapt, but I think that will be okay. It's not like we're going to be jumping around. It's bolted down a little bit, and it's not going anywhere. I tried to move it. It wouldn't move. I couldn't figure out why it wouldn't move, and I realized there was a bolt in there. All right, and um, I'm not sure about the electrical connections. I mean, it's hooked up, but there's no... Obviously, the old compressor had a electrical box on it, and this... Uh, bolted into there and uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to do anything with that. The main thing to do right now is to get this thing up and running because the original problem was um, it wouldn't pull down below 16 degrees. So once we get this aluminum cover set up, fixed, we can put that back in and um, we'll be good to go. All right, we will be back. Okay, here is the you know, video of the bottom of this Trollson. They all have these big wheels on them, and here, of course, is your leveling feet in the front. This is your water valve, same valve as used on the older Sub Zeros. Um, exactly the same valve, except for the, the bracket, but it's basically the same valve. And then, of course, this is, this is your drain pan. And if you can see in there, let me get a light. Let 
Okay, so there's a heater. You see those two pieces of copper tubing? That's a heater loop. And that heater loop um, evaporates whatever moisture accumulates in this pan. This is your drain tube right there. All right, so let's continue to uh, investigate this machine. Okay, so it's been two hours since we last checked this, and the pressure is exactly 85 on the low side, 100 on the high side. It's exactly what it was two hours ago. So I'm assuming that that it was leaking at the filter dryer. Remember, we were picking up some traces of Freon at this joint right here. So, uh, and also when I first got the machine in here, I checked there was some oil on the cap tube to the filter line. So anyway, uh, I think we're probably in a position now to uh, let it, I'm going to let it sit a little bit while, a while longer, and then I'm going to put the vacuum, two-stage vacuum pump on it and pump it down as much as I can, and then we're going to charge it up with Freon. Freon 130, this is a 134A compressor. The machine was originally a R12, and whoever put that compressor in there uh, changed it over. So we'll see what happens. Okay, so I'm going to brush this down a little bit, try to clean it up. I'm just going to try to put a bead of solder around this hole so it'll be easier to sweat in that nipple. One thing about aluminum, it's it's got it oxidizes and it's got a layer of protective layer on it and it's just really hard to solder and another one of the one of the reasons is because it dissipates heat so quickly so you need a lot of heat but you have to be careful not to put too much heat because it'll melt it this is acetone I'm using acetone on here clean any residue on it and then we'll see if we can use this new turbo torch and here's this aluminum rod so let's see what happens here Okay, so there's a little bit of solder on there. That's what I wanted to make sure it would stick. Whew, that's hot. I got to get a new <laughs> video system here. I, I have no idea what you people are seeing. Um, all right, so let's let this cool down a little bit. And then we'll uh, attempt to uh, solder this in. Now this, I hope this is aluminum, because if this is not aluminum, <laughs> I'm in trouble. Let's see if I have a magnet here. Yeah, it's not magnetic. So it, from looking at this, you can see that it's, it's got this ring around it. It, it was pressed into the aluminum which is be very difficult to do. Yeah, I'm going to let this cool down and we'll come back to it. I'm going to try to pull that as tight as possible or maybe find a, a clamp that I can clamp something on there to keep it um, tight. All right, so let's uh, figure out what we're going to do here. Okay, so I got this three quarter inch or five eighth inch uh, steel on this linear burring here. I'm going to use this as a, uh, a guide to restore this aluminum to its original configuration. I'm using a brass tip uh, hammer here. Oh, 
that's coming loose. Okay. All right. That's better. Now. Let's see how we're going to do this. Where is... Okay, so here's the nipple. Going to have to open that up. Won't fit in there. This is a reamer. Half inch reamer. a little off center here I'm using a nylon edge here I hope you can see that. I'm going to just adjust the camera a little bit. Yeah, it's um, that's a pretty big gap to have to fill, but we're going to have to try it. Okay, so I rigged up this uh, position here on my welding bench and stuck the uh, the nipple in through one of the oh, five eighths holes there to, to keep it stable. And then I'll just, I'm cleaning it now with acetone and just hope that the solder is going to flow in there and stick. Uh, we have one more rod here and we have this little one left over. So let's see what's going to happen here. Okay, I'm pretty sure that's stuck good, but there's a gap here, so we're going to have to fill that in, and that's, that's going to be really tricky. I was trying to do that, and it wasn't working because the, the aluminum got oxidized, and the solder wouldn't stick. But you see what I mean when you add too much heat, you see what happens, the aluminum well, uh, melts. Okay, so I was successful in welding the nipple onto the aluminum. That much I can say, as you can see. But there's a gap there. You can see there's a crack because the, the aluminum melted, and I kind of predicted that it would or could because it's a really soft metal. But the nipple is, is soldered in there pretty well. 
So rather than take a risk and filling that gap, because it's going to take a technique uh, to do that, I think maybe it would be best if I just uh, mix up some epoxy and, and seal it with the epoxy instead. And that would make the job a lot easier because I don't want to have to go out and buy a new evaporator. And I can see that this has been welded before. You can see the joints uh, from the manufacturer. So, and I do have a TIG welder and an aluminum MIG welder, but I just think that uh, I don't want to take the chance and mess it up. It's easier to use epoxy. Okay, so we will uh, do that, mix it up, and get back. Okay, so I'm going to mix this epoxy up, and I'm going to put a little dab of silicone on the back side of this nipple so the epoxy doesn't seep through. We can always peel this off and do something better. But that's the way it is for now. And this is just here to protect the, the metal so it doesn't, I mean the epoxy so it doesn't drip through and stick to my bench. Okay, so let's get this mixed up. Okay, let's go put this on. Okay, so um, that should do it. Just want to make sure there's some over that silicone there. Because when this dries, what we can do is um, put another coating epoxy on the, out, on the outside of it. Or a coating of silicone, either one. It should work. The main thing is that it's it's soldered in, it's welded in, and it won't cr break off as easily the next time around. So let's um, finish this up. Let that dry overnight. We'll come back to it tomorrow, and we'll continue uh, with this with the project. Okay, here we have pressures are still 85 on the low side, maybe up at 86. High side, 100, same as yesterday. I let it sit overnight. It's now 12.30 on a Sunday afternoon. I'm convinced that we got the leak fixed. So now we're going to drain the air out, pull a deep vacuum, charge it up, and let's see what happens. Get back to you. Okay, so we let this uh, epoxy dry overnight. It's nice and hard, very sturdy. Uh, the next thing we're going to do uh, is put this cover back on and uh, we uh, we pull a vacuum on this we let the vacuum pump run for uh, a few hours we're ready to charge it up the only thing I need to do before I put that cover on is I have to loosen up this drain pipe and pull it away because um, the defrost heater sticks down and so it gets in the way it gets in the way of slipping that nipple into that pipe so I'm going to try to pull it away and make that a little easier now in case you didn't know uh, there is two terminator switches the defrost one's a defrost termination switch the other one's for the fan so the fans, the fans do not come on 
until the evaporator cools down. So after it comes out of a defrost cycle, the fan stays off until the switch closes and then so it doesn't circulate hot air. And of course the defrost terminator is in case the, the timer got stuck in a defrost cycle, it doesn't cook the food. Other than that, we're probably going to maybe put a new ice maker in here. I'll take that apart and see if it's if we can clean it. Uh, but basically, that's uh, that's it. So let's uh, get the fan cover on here, and then <clears throat> we'll um, charge it up. Okay, here we got the uh, the drain pipe hooked back in there. I'm going to put a little silicone around there just in case. Um, and also, I'm going to put some silicone back here. So, to get that drain on properly, I didn't want to risk bending the nipple on the, that aluminum plate and having it break off. So, I loosened up this U-clamp and pulled this pipe out a little bit, put the evaporator plate in, and then I pushed this back in. So, now... Um, I'm going to put some sealer around here, some silicone, clear silicone, keep the air out. And they had some, they had some putty in there before, which kind of dried up. Okay, so the unit is turned on. The fans are not running, of course, because it's not cold in there. So once the evaporator coil gets cold, those fans should come on. And so now we've purged the air out of the line. We're going to recharge this. And quite frankly, let me hook up my scale. I want to see how much Freon we wind up putting in here. Okay, so this gauge is reading about 487 ounces. 487 is jumping between 2, 3, 4. That's, that we're not going to count those tenths. 487. We're going to open up our valve and start charging it on the low side with the vapor. 487. We'll write that down. Okay. So now the meter is reading 468 we we had it at 487 so that's 21 ounces according to the serial plate this thing takes 15 ounces of R12 it shouldn't be that much different with R134A so I'm looking at the gauge we've got some we're still in the vacuum but we're looking at 150 pounds back uh, head pressure and it's not that hot in here so I'm starting to think, okay, I think we have a partial restriction in here. Because the, the, the head pressure should be around 125. But I can consult the temp pressure temperature chart just to be sure. Stand by. Okay, so here we have a pressure temperature chart for 134A. And the temperature in the shop is 68 degrees. So you add 35 degrees for heat of compression, which comes out to 103. So the, the head pressure should be 130.6. So 125 to 130 is what I thought. So let's go see where it's at now. Okay, so we're still 10 inches in a vacuum. We're running about 140. So the head pressure is up a little higher and we have 22 ounces, 21 ounces of gas in there, which is too much. Something is amiss. And my bet is 
it's in the cap tube because some person didn't know any better put leak sealer in this machine and probably did not pull a deep vacuum on it before he put it in or whoever put it in and that's what happened so now the next step is we're going to have to drop the evaporator plate down again and we're going to have to disconnect unsweat the cap tube here and we're going to have to see if it's plugged or what we might be able to do is replace the whole capillary tube and I find out what size it is that's going to be a, a bit of a challenge but it can be done okay stand by okay so here's another progress report it's now four o'clock it has been running for a couple hours not much change still in a this is reading nine inches in a vacuum 150 pounds pressure on the high side and it is starting to cool fans are on temperature is 68 no I'm sorry 60 degrees so it's good. I'm not sure if I want to let it run for a couple days or if I want to just take it apart drain it check the cap to it or, or replace the heat exchanger so we actually have 467 we had 487 so we put 20 ounces in there so I don't want to put any more gas in there I'm just gonna let it run for a while and uh, we'll see where we're at okay so I shut it off the pressure is starting to balance out uh, and the, the low side pressure started coming up right away which uh, normally means there's no restriction I'm at least not a total restriction it's could be a partial restriction in there so uh, I think I should let it run for a long long time before I determine to uh, or decide to take everything apart and check the cap tube I don't know there's there could be something else wrong that I'm not catching maybe uh, the compressor is too strong or or the evaporator that was replaced is not the right evaporator uh, I don't know yet but we will continue to work on it until we find out what it is okay so I cut off a piece of the tubing here and I'm looking at the inlet of this capillary tube and it looks it looks dirty you see these little black marks on this paper towel here that came out of that tubing so it's it's kind of gross actually it should it shouldn't be any dirt in the system at all and it, it is clear I mean I can see it's not crimped it's not shot, soldered shut but it's dirty and I can look in here and see a lot of dirty oil so I'm assuming somebody did put leak seal in here because I can smell it it smells like bubble gum uh, so my next thing now is I checked uh, the capillary too for clear it's it's clear so now I'm gonna flush flush the system out with some uh, uh, cleaner I have some stuff I picked up at the refrigeration supply house that to, for flushing out systems I it's not R11 but it's something similar some kind of a chemical clean so we'll flush that through the system and see if we can get that crap out of there and maybe uh, I may put a, a larger liquid line dryer on there um, and we'll take it from there all right I will be back okay so now uh, we're going to flush out the system, try to clean it up, get all the crud out of the lines. I'm going to disconnect this uh, 3 8 uh, flare nut right here and uh, run my uh, pump through the suction line into the evaporator coil and out of the evaporator coil right here. And will flush that. 
and then we're going to flush out the high side by we're going to disconnect unsolder this filter dryer here and unsolder this line here on the compressor and hook up a Schrader valve a port a process port here so we can hook our pump uh, hand pump into here and then flush out this line that goes all the way down to the heater loop back up comes out here goes through the condenser comes back out here that'll flush the whole system out so what I've done right now was I've gotten um, <clears throat> I'm, I picked up this 3 8 flare union so I'm gonna make this um, tool here so that uh, we can just I'll drill this out and solder that in there and we can use this as a, a quick tool to uh, to flush that out and then what I have is I have a pump here a hand pump will flush this uh, AC flush right here I lost the label like don't rem mem remember who made this but it's specifically for flushing out uh, air conditioners and refrigerators okay let's uh, let's get back okay so I drilled this out to 3 8 this is gonna go in here like that I'm gonna clean this off sand it down and braze this or solder this on and then we'll have a a tool here that we can use to flush out that system want to make sure this fitting is going to work. Yes, okay. I'm pretty sure it's the right one. Yep. Okay. Let's get this other piece uh, soldered on here and then we'll start our flush. Okay, I usually wait for it to glow before I start to put the solder on there, but this is an amazing torch. It just saves me so much time having to hook up my MC tank, and it gets really hot. I think I said this before, the only problem with this is that it's got a big flame. Okay, so we have our pump set up here. Now, we'll get our flush. And I have to put something on the other side to catch whatever comes out of there. And so we'll look for something and then maybe an empty bottle. So I hooked up this soda bottle here, this water bottle here, just to catch the 
flush liquid to see if, to see if any debris comes out and we'll see what happens okay so here's what I did I rigged up to my air hose I rigged up this control here this air handler <laughs> sprayer I put a process port in there so I could screw this on to this hose and then I can watch what comes out of there I put a, I put a bunch of a lot of fluid in there but I didn't want to fill the evaporator all the way up so let's see what's going to happen here oh look at that crap Woo. all right that is really disgusting all right, so let me, uh, this is contaminated. I won't be able to reuse this again. I'm going to have to get another container. Okay, let me get back to you. Okay, so I got another bottle here. Let's see if we can get some more to drain this out. It's a lot cleaner. Alright, so now I'm going to just going to get a do old rag. Well, that looks a lot different. Look at the difference between this oil or this fluid and this fluid. You can see that this first, the first flush was um, what did the most cleaning. Alright, so now I'm going to take this rag and capture whatever residual oil is in there. Okay, so we're going to clean this up a little bit now, and then we're going to do the high side, the condenser, and the heater loop. I'm expecting that to be even worse. Then once we're done with that, we'll solder um, a reducer on here and then hook our cap tube back up and recharge it and see if we can get this thing to work. Okay, so we now rigged up a uh, port from the discharge line off the compressor it's going to go down through the heater loop around through the condenser and out here into this water bottle so let's see what happens I put in I didn't fill it up I just put in maybe uh, a cup let's see what happens
that's what I suspected. Dirty, dirtier than the evaporator. I know this is a messy job, but it's a necessary job. I'll clean everything up when I'm done here, but um, I have to blow out the rest of this fluid. And then we can start to clean up and put things back together. Okay, so here's what I did. I stepped it down from 3 eighths to 5 sixteenths to quarter inch to 3 sixteenths. I got a nice even uh, flow there, hopefully. So I'm just going to, uh, I'm pressurizing it right now. Put some nitrogen in there and uh, checking for leaks. If everything's okay, then we're going to um, button it up and put some gas in here and let it run overnight and see where we're at tomorrow. Okay, let's be back. Okay, progress report. What we did today was just to check the uh, heater loop to make sure it, was, it wasn't clogged up. We disconnected the, the line here and the line here and I blew out the, these two lines here that go down into the heater loop and it was clear, it was no problem. But last night, I got it all back together and pulled the vacuum and uh, recharged it with 134A and we had the same problem. 10, 10 inches in a vacuum, head pressure a little higher than normal. Okay, progress report. Here is the problem. It's not the compressor, it's not a restriction. It is the heat exchanger has come apart. Let me show you here. This capillary tube is supposed to be soldered to the suction line like that and it's come apart and it's it's understandable because the, the machine's probably over 30 years old and then if you go inside it's the same thing here look the capillary tube should be it's soldered right here I don't know if I hope you can see that but it's all come apart all the way up to the compressor so I call Trollson the heat exchanger is no longer available so we're going to have to make one. Either make one or we're going to have to take this existing suction line heat exchanger capillary tube out and resolder it and put it back in, which is probably going to be maybe harder to do than just running a new capillary tube through the suction line. So uh, Trollson said it takes uh, 12 feet of 042 capillary tube for this particular machine it's uh, minus 5 to plus 5 degrees third horsepower R12 machine 12 feet 042 so that's where we're at right now uh, we will come back and uh, we'll figure out how we're going to do this but I've done this before what you can do is you can cut the suction line and put a for this example for this is a 3 8 we can get a 3 8 coupling a sweat coupling drill a one-eighth inch hole through it and run the capillary tube through the suction line and come back up on the top into the filter dryer. So I think that might be easier to do than uh, taking the suction line out because that is a lot of work. I'll be back. Okay, we're back and I decided to remove the heat exchanger. So you could see the problem. And you can see it right here. The, the capillary tube has come unsoldered from the suction line. That goes like that, like that, all the way down. I mean, almost the whole thing is disconnected. Look at that. And my assumption is that the person who changed the compressor probably got a false reading uh, with, um, because when your heat exchanger comes undone like this it usually gives you higher back pressure so they probably thought the compressor was bad they changed the compressor but it never worked so uh, the next thing is to decide whether or not we're going to fix this because we can fix this I do have another video on rebuilding a 22 IM ice maker where I show you how to repair the cap, the cap uh, re, um, the heat exchanger 
<clears throat> but the problem with this particular heat exchanger is right here, there's a major kink right there. So we could either solder that back together, swag it, swedge it out, or put a coupling in there, uh, fix that, because the shape is already there. So I also removed the compressor so I have room up here to work. So that's where we're at right now. And I have to run on a call. I'll be back and uh, I'll clean this up a little bit and see if we can just fix this. I think that might be the easiest way out. Okay, I'll get back to you later. Okay, so we're going to pre-drill some holes here so we can mount this compressor properly. I noticed, I mean, notice that I've made the markings on here. Uh, the mounting holes for the Tecumseh are six and a half by four. So I put a little pilot hole here before I put in the self-tapping, self-drilling screw. Just to give it some place to start. Find it. There it is. Okay. Okay. Let's get these things started. afraid of that. It's, it's biting into the <coughs> previous bolt hole there. Let me drill that out. In the meantime, we'll take these out. The holes are there. It goes there for now. Another thing done. Now, let's move on. Okay, so the old heat exchanger is definitely no good because I tried running lacquer thinner through it, enamel reducer. I pulled a deep vacuum on it to try to pull it through, and it's just clogged somewhere. And it's probably a result of the previous repair people putting leak sealer in there because once that stuff gets hard, if there's any moisture in the system, it just turns into a rock. Okay, so we had to make a little change here. I, um, the tubing that I bought from the local hardware store, it says refrigeration on it. Refrigeration. But when I went to bend it with the tubing bender, it kinked. And it's just... It's not made in America. This is obviously made offshore. It's much thinner than uh, the regular tubing that you get from uh, refrigeration supply houses, which is what I had to go out and buy. It's much thicker, much thicker wall thickness. It's stronger. You can bend it. Anyway, I made a new heat exchanger. I've got eight and a half feet of 3 8 copper tubing and 70 to um, 70, see, well, 12 feet 
of uh, 042 soldered onto the 62 inches of it is soldered onto the tubing. That's exactly what the old one was like. So now we're going to um, start bending this thing up and getting it in, hooking it back up. We're going to flare. Uh, we're going to flare that end, much like there, and we're going to try to follow the curves and um, get this thing uh, installed. Okay, so we are just about finished with this project. Uh, I put the evaporator coil in there. Fixed that all up, cleaned it all up, and now we have to charge it. But I just want to show you a couple of things that I did. I, as I've said before, I made a new, I made a new heat exchanger. The old one was definitely clogged up. So I sealed everything up. I secured everything. I rebolted the compressor down. This is all new suction heat exchanger and it's ready to go. So I pulled the vacuum on it. Now it's the compressor is running. It's a 29 inch vacuum. Who knows how accurate that is. However, I'm now going to fill it up with Freon and the seal your the serial tag says it takes 15 ounces of R12 but this is our 134A. So I think I'll charge it instead of weighing in the gas, which I normally do, I think what I'm gonna do is charge it by uh, superheat or by, by the suction line temperature. That's usually, now there's some, there's some Freon in here from before, it says seven ounces on the R22 scale, which is about six, and a quarter ounces of R134A and I've got these little marks here because on an R22 scale each half inch represents one ounce of R134A so that's why I use that anyway we're gonna put this whatever we got here in here seven ounces of say six and a quarter ounces it takes should take about 15, but we'll at least use this up. Here we go. All right, so let me finish this, and then we'll come back and complete the project, put, it, put the cover back on and the back cover on and make sure it's working properly we'll let it give it some time to pull down maybe let it run overnight so i will i'll be back to finish it up okay we are back we have a working freezer right now we're running about one inch above zero one one pound pressure and the head pressure high side pressure looks like 140. it's a little higher than i would like it but it may be my gauge because it's an old gauge and I've checked the uh, the um, temperature the suction line is cool so I think we have enough gas in it I could do a superheat test but I when you've been in business a long time ask anybody they can just touch a suction line and know what the superheat is you just go by feel so we're gonna let it run overnight see we got here we're down to 18 degrees that's a world of difference between what it was when I got it well when I got it they said it was only pulling down to 16 so we know we had a clogged cap tube now the the temperature is set at 5 degrees negative 5 uh, so let's see if it reaches that temperature. I'm going to let it run overnight. And if all is well tomorrow, I'll put the cover back on, button it up, and post this video. Thanks for watching. Okay, so we let this thing run overnight. <clears throat> the head pressure, high side pressure is now just about normal. It's about 130 pounds pressure. That's, that's satisfactory to me. It's running a little bit in the vacuum, but that's because 
It's R134A and it's minus four degrees in there. So that's gonna take care of this project. We got it up and running. I'm just gonna adjust the thermostat and so um, it shuts off at zero. But other than that, everything looks good. Freezing cold. Got another thermometer in here, a little over zero. I just had the door open. So anyway, that completes this project of the Trollson UR30LT. Uh, thanks for watching. We'll get back to you with another project soon.